Hello everyone and welcome to Dual Enrollment Chemistry 100. This is the introduction to chemistry course. It's um, slated for non-science majors um, to get their GE physical science um, credits done in college. So we're going to start off um, by taking a look at um, chapter one in our textbook which is entitled The Chemical World. This chapter is just an introduction to all things chemistry. So in this chapter, the author starts out um, by talking about a can of soda, right? Asking you, hey, what's it made out of? Why does it taste sweet? What happens when you open it, right? What happens if you drink too much of it? And a bunch of questions about why, why, why? Why does it do this? Why does it do that, okay? Um, so these are kind of just having you think of the different um, components of the soda, the can, right, which is made out of one type of um, material, typically aluminum, right, um, and then you've got the soda, the actual liquid inside um, that is, <clears throat> excuse me, is a mixture of uh, water and sugar and some acid in there and some carbon dioxide that's been dissolved in, um, and so there's a bunch of different properties about this soda that we can investigate at a chemical nature. And that's exactly what um, chemists are interested in. They're interested in the connections between the properties of substances and the structure of the particles that compose them. Okay, so they're interested in uh, knowing, you know, substances, how they behave, and understanding why they behave by looking at what they're made of. And so if you remember in regular chemistry, um, everything is made from atoms. That is the smallest um, unit of matter. And um, those atoms can combine and bond together to make molecules. So for example, if we're talking about uh, the can of soda, right? Um, carbon and oxygen atoms can combine to make the carbon dioxide that makes the, the soda fizz. Hydrogen and oxygen atoms can come together to make water, right? Which is the um, solvent of this whole mixture. Um, and we know that um, the carbon dioxide and the water have different structures and therefore different properties. So looking down here, um, carbon dioxide on the lower left is a what we call a linear molecule. Um, and it is nonpolar, meaning that it has no charged ends. And the, this is all stuff that we're going to be learning this year. Um, so, and it's, it's also a covalently bonded molecule. And so that is going to behave much differently than water over here, um, which we see is a bent molecule, and we see it has little charges, positive and negative signs. And so that's going to behave much differently than our carbon dioxide molecule. And we see that um, <clears throat> in the fact uh, that the carbon dioxide does not mix well with the water. And one of the big reasons is, um, A, carbon dioxide is a gas versus um, water, which is a liquid at room temperature. So that state of property is a big thing, but also the polarity is a big uh, reason why they don't mix as well. Water is a polar substance, so that means it will only kind of interact with other uh, molecules that have the positive and negative ends, the polarity. And carbon dioxide doesn't have that, so carbon dioxide cannot stick to water. Therefore, when you open it up, all those bubbles start to come out. So we have different structures and different properties. Right, when we're making a can of soda, we're gonna use pressure. It's another thing that we're going to um, investigate during this uh, semester of chemistry. Um, <clears throat> gonna use pressure to force the carbon dioxide to mix with the water, right? Um, and then when you, you know, pop the lid, that pressure gets released and the carbon dioxide gets to escape because again, it can't be held by the water because it's nonpolar. All right, so these are the different things that um, chemists are interested in figuring out the connections of why substances behave like they do, looking at what they're made of. So you should know by now that uh, chemicals make up everything we come in contact with. All right, chemical is just a generic term for substance, for atoms, molecules, you know, compounds. And chemistry is... Um, <clears throat> Basically, the point of chemistry is to explain the properties and behavior of chemicals by helping us understand the molecules that compose them. 
So, you know, looking down here, this is a clear liquid and this is a clear liquid. The one on the left is essential for life. The one on the right kills life. So, got to be something in the chemical property that makes up those clear liquids um, that gives it the, the property and behavior that it does. Okay. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at in chemistry, taking a look at what substances are made of and why they behave the way they do. All right, so just a quick review of um, what we learned back in regular chem. All things are made of atoms. Atoms bond together to form molecules, right? Atoms and molecules are going to determine how matter behaves, and there is a direct connection between the world of atoms and the molecules and the world we experience, right? So the world we experience is a direct connection to the world of atoms and what's going on okay all right um, so chemistry basically is a science uh, that tries to figure out how matter behaves by studying how atoms and molecules behave all right so you're gonna see in um, the later half of this chapter um, the author talks about the scientific method the scientific method is kind of his general term of um, you know the science process of figuring out you know the connection between things by observing and experimenting um, with those with those substances. So the scientific method is just a way of learning um, that emphasizes observation and experimentation to understand the world. And so the key characteristics of the scientific method is one observation, two hypothesis, and a hypothesis is just a tentative explanation of the observations, kind of a guess about what's going on. Right, um, and then we have experimentation, and through experimentation, we can figure out if we were right about our guess about what's going on. Okay, so here um, in this picture down below is kind of a really good um, uh, visual of what's going on. So, you know, you observe something. Hey, I wonder why that happens, um, and then you kind of hypothesize maybe it happens because of this. And then you experiment, oh, okay, can I make it happen because of this? Um, and if, and then, you know, you come to a conclusion. And if you can't, right, then you're going to be going this way. And you're going to be revising your hypothesis and making another guess of how it works. And then doing the experiment again and getting a conclusion. If um, what you did experiment did make that thing happen that you observed, then you um, can go here to the left where your hypothesis is supportive and then um, you're going to reproduce the experiment to make sure that you can get it to do it again and again and again um, because real good science is repeatable and reliable meaning that um, whatever conclusion you came up with is the conclusion that would be it would be the same conclusion if you did the experiment one time or a thousand times Okay, so repeatability and reliability are super important in science. So important that when you do get, um, you know, repeatable conclusions that are very reliable, they become what are called theories and laws. So a law is something that summarizes past observations and can predict new ones. And a theory is an explanation for the observations and laws. Like a, it's a model of the way nature um, is, is going. Okay. So that's kind of the scientific method. Now, going along with this um, scientific method, the author has a little inset in the chapter, and it's a really good um, little story about um, back in the day, in like the 1700s, I believe. Um, <clears throat> what, um, you know, scientists and people, how they thought things burned. Okay, so the question back then was, why do things burn? They notice some things burn, some things don't. So why do some things burn and other things don't, right? So their observation, uh, made some observations, right? Um, like metals burn to form a culx. A culx is just this white powder um, substance. So if you burn a metal, you'll, you'll get a culx or a metal oxide. Um, they didn't know it was a metal oxide yet, and so they just called it culx. Um, and you can actually return the, this powder back to metal bits um, by reacting it with charcoal. 
So they made some interesting observations and their first hypothesis or the first guess about why things burned or how things burn, what happened to substances when things burned, okay, was this hypothesis of phlogiston. Phlogiston, <clears throat> they thought, was something that was present in these substances that burned. And when, substance, when something does burn, it releases this phlogiston. So kind of thinking like phlogiston was this, um, you know, substance inside the material that when the material burns, the phlogiston gets released. <clears throat> and then when, you know, you mix it with charcoal or something to get, you know, the original substance back, the phlogiston gets reabsorbed. Okay. Um, so that was their initial hypothesis. Now, um, a uh, scientist named Morveau um, did some experiments. He theorized, okay, well, if phlogiston is released when something is burned, then that means the substances should be losing weight, right? So Morveau did many, many experiments where he burned different substances, and he, and, and he weighed before the substance before he burned, and he weighed the substance after he burned, okay? And um, Morveau, after doing this multiple times, many, many, many times, probably for many years, noticed that all of the substances always gained weight after they burned instead of lost weight. So that did not go along with the hypothesis that was being made. Okay, this, this phlogiston hypothesis. So phlogiston was something that was present in the substances and released when burned, then the substances should get lighter. But Morveau noticed the substances get heavier. So what they do? They didn't try to manipulate the data or be like, you know, oh, well, for that one, I just, just brush that one under the, the rug. No, no, no. They went back and they said, okay, we're wrong and we need to revise our hypothesis. So looking back at, you know, Morveau's conclusion of things gained weight, then they have to figure out what are they, what is this burning substance taking from air to make it gain weight, right? Um, and... This is where Lavoisier, Antoine Lavoisier, he was a tax collector in France, who um, was a hobby scientist. In fact, he was such a hobby scientist and so rich because he was a tax collector that he had his own giant um, uh, science laboratory, kind of in like the basement of his, you know, castle house thing, right? Um, and so he did lots of experiments at night on the weekends and whenever he wasn't working, um, in fact, his um, wife also helped him. His wife helped translate um, uh, papers, you know, from other scientists into French um, so he can understand. And they worked um, for many, many years on lots of scientific um, conclusions and experiments. And so um, one of these was this figuring out what's burning. And so Lavoisier and your book does a much better explanation than I do. So Lavoisier actually built this huge contraption here to figure out um, what it is that um, things take from air when they burn. And basically, um, he figured out that, you know, it was oxygen in the air that makes things burn. And the oxygen gets um, reacted with that substance and um, that substance it, that substance green, gains oxygen and um, that's why it gains weight so um, through lots of experimentation hypothesis all that jazz um, they came up with a theory of combustion that is still valid today anything that burns must have oxygen around it um, any other gas will not allow the substances to burn um, and that's what happens it it uh, absorbs oxygen from the air when things burn. All right, so this last slide is um, a conclusion of the last little section of chapter one in your textbook, um, where the author offers some um, ways in order to be successful in chemistry. And um, he claims that, you know, there's three basic things that um, you need in order to be successful in chemistry. You need curiosity and imagination, um, kind of a curiosity of wanting to know why things work the way they do. Um, calculation, being able to do some math um, to help, you know, figure things out about how things work. And then commitment, um, basically, you know, just keep, keep going, trying to figure things out um, rather than stopping and um, just giving up. 
And so he quotes the um, 1981 Nobel Prize for Chemistry, um, <clears throat> Roald Hoffman, who says, a chemist requires no special talent, I'm glad to say. Anyone can do it with hard work. So for this class, um, I do actually uh, agree with this. You do need some curiosity of um, and some motivation of wanting to know why things work the way they do so that you can keep engaged in the class. Um, you definitely need to be strong in math, uh, but not like calculus level math. We're talking like algebra math. So um, can you plug things into an equation? Can you, um, you know, rearrange an algebraic equation to solve for a different variable? And can you do unit conversions? Um, converting one unit to another. Those are the three, you know, or actually two main um, um, things, two main mathematical concepts you'll need. And then obviously commitment, um, can't quit halfway through. Uh, this course jam packs a lot of chemistry. It's introduction, it's a survey course. So we do a bunch of different um, topics in chemistry. And so um, one thing does build on the other, so we can't just give up. And then, um, you know, try to get back on the horse to succeed. Okay, so uh, that concludes our first lecture of the course. And um, we'll see you around.